Hi there folks, how are we doing today? It's great to see you. We've got great autumnal weather at the moment. The leaves are still in the trees, but they're definitely changing. The air's lovely and clear, but it is cool right enough. So why don't we head inside? I see you've got a couple of parcels here. We'll take these inside, see what they are. Come on in, you're very welcome. Um, well, uh, loads of us are getting parcels delivered uh, at the moment for various things, so uh, let's see what we've got in these. I think I know what it is. Usually when we get a parcel delivered, of course we've already ordered something and I ordered uh, a couple of things uh, a while back and I wonder if this has all been printed. Oh yeah, brilliant. I've got a poster for outside to go on the notice board. Uh, there is hope. That's exactly what we ordered. That's good. And. Uh, this is a big one, excuse me. What's this? Oh yeah, great. And a banner actually, uh, with the exact same message. Try and show it to you. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, fantastic. Good, it's big in it. <laughs> it's got our website on it uh, as well. So I'll find a way of getting that outside. We really want to be uh, giving out a message of hope as a church and in each of our lives as well. We have a God of hope and with a spirit within us, uh, we're filled with the hope of God and we certainly need hope at the moment. Well, one thing we do as a church each year is we fill up shoe boxes uh, that have gifts in them and are taken away to be delivered to those less fortunate than ourselves to bless them and it's a message of hope that goes with them as well. So let's watch a video together now uh, and a way that we can all get involved in bringing hope to others. I feel like it wouldn't be Christmas without shoeboxes now. Being in this project for so long and seeing what shoeboxes do every year there hasn't been a Christmas where I haven't seen shoeboxes being delivered. So I don't think I could imagine it in any other way. My name is Carmen. I work for Blaise Banat in Jimbolia. I'm from Jimbolia. I grew up here as a child. And I've been working for Blaise for five years now. This particular area is one of the poorest areas of Jimbolia. It's right at the outskirts and it used to be where factory workers lived during communism. The houses are very, very run down. A lot of them will not have electricity or running water inside. So we set up Talita Kum 2 in a building that used to be part of the, the brick factory. This way, a lot of the children who come to the program are children who live right across the road. There's a lot of poverty in Jimbolia. There's a lot of early school leaving, a lot of children who don't get to grow up in a normal family environment. There may be children in this area who are raised by other relatives, not their parents. Every year, unfortunately, we do lose a girl to early marriage because she grows up with five siblings and she shares a bed with all of them, she feels like I should move on. So supporting girls in our program, I think is more important because they are more vulnerable. It's 30 years ago since the revolution and it's 30 years since we've had social services in Romania, like proper social services. There was no child protection before the revolution because communists did not want to admit that there was any problem with children being abandoned or children living in poverty. The laws are fairly new, they're still changing, they still need to be improved. And local authorities are still not used to the idea of actually visiting families, helping them overcome their circumstance. I think a way that they are improving is by collaborating with us, with Blyce, because we work face to face, we get our boots dirty, we go into their homes. We work with quite a lot of families. We've got 80 children in our program. Our goal is to end poverty, especially child poverty. 
keeping them in school, helping them to read and write, and encouraging them to continue their education even after eight years of school. We give shoe boxes to very needy families, people who have nothing, people who don't have a proper home, who don't have electricity, who can't buy these things themselves, people who wear rags even in winter or go barefoot. It's a wonderful experience to give them a shoe box and teach them about all these things, how they can use them, how they can take care of themselves. Before the shoebox lorry arrives, we all get very nervous with anticipation and we think, okay, we have to be ready, we have to have people, we have to know what we're doing, where we're putting all the shoeboxes. Before the lorry arrives, we're like told maybe a day before or a few hours before, everybody gets ready. We unload the lorry with maybe four or five people. Somebody is writing down lists, okay, how many boxes of each type. Then we start talking to all our Blyster partners, so orphanages or organizations that work with street children or homeless people, uh, anybody we know who does really good social work, NGOs mostly. I would really like to see more Romanians making shoeboxes in the future. I think it's a project that has stirred up some interest in our country and I think there are well-off Romanians who could donate a shoebox and they are donating some. So I would like to see a lot of Romanians getting involved with shoeboxes. As a Christian organization, we really appreciate Bible literature in the shoeboxes. It reminds the people that receive the shoeboxes that if you could receive a shoebox, a blessing from someone you don't know and someone who doesn't know you, how much more would God give you? who knows you so well. Whenever the shoeboxes arrive, there's a lot of joy. Adults become children. Children go ecstatic, wild with joy. It's a beautiful thing to see, especially when you work year-round with these families and you see that nothing brings them more joy than receiving a colored box with something special inside. Jimbolia is just one small town in Eastern Europe but shoeboxes bring so much joy to the people in need here and elsewhere. If you're thinking of helping someone out this year, consider making a shoebox for someone in need. Well, it's such a great way to bring hope to others in a very practical and real way that's so meaningful and it will bring joy to many people. So in the description below this video, I'll put in a link uh, in order that you can find out more about that. But for now, it's warming up in here. I can take my jacket off and get settled in as we turn our attention and our thoughts towards God's Word. Hi everyone! It goes without saying that I've missed seeing you all in person, but it is good to see those of you we get to on the Zoom chats on Sunday. Today I'll be reading part of our Bible reading, starting with Nehemiah 6, 15-16. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid 
and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. And then also from Nehemiah 7, verses 1 to, se 1 to 6. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been written first, who written, I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. A little blip there. This is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. It's good to see you all, even if I don't see you right now. I miss you all. God bless you. Well, Nehemiah and all the people had been through a lot of trouble trying to repair and rebuild this wall that had trouble from the outside. They had trouble within their own community with issues of justice and fairness, which they had to sort out as well. And of course, they had issues within themselves. They really didn't think at one point they could do it. They felt that their strength was giving out. Uh, they felt there was too much rubble to clear away. Uh, they said in chapter 4, verse 10, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall, but they were encouraged and they kept on going. And then in chapter 6 and verses 15 to 16, we read, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Well done, Nehemiah and the folks that got there. They had done it. They completed the rebuilding and the repairing of the wall. They did it. And they themselves say they did it with the help of our God. They realized that their strength was in him. It's something that was so important to Nehemiah. He says later on in chapter 8 and verse 10, he says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Paul the Apostle was somebody else who realized that for himself. And uh, he said in Philippians and in chapter 4, uh, he says in verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then in verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. His strength was in God. And in fact, he said to the Philippians earlier in chapter one, verse six, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The people here had completed the wall. It had been repaired, it had been rebuilt. Now it was done and through Jesus, Although we have peace and security and so many blessings through him, we know that we're still a work in progress, but even then the Lord will carry that work on to completion in him. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The blessings of God are manifold as they're poured into our life. His strength is there for us. His blessings are great. His promises uh, are there for us. And you know, we are going to need God's help for this next stage of the restrictions. We're six months in 
and all the indications are at the moment there's certainly another six months to go through the autumn and the winter and so I think it's going to be different this time uh, last time round it was pretty clear what we could not or more importantly what we couldn't do and the weather was beautiful it was sunny and it was warm the traffic had died right down it was bird song filling the air and although it was terribly hard there were still blessings there for us well god's blessings are still there for us but this autumn and winter i think for many of us will be somewhat different and we will certainly need to look to the lord for his help uh, and for his strength nehemiah had that he had the he had god's help with him he also had great people around him uh, as well and that's so important we need that too um, in fact in chapter 7 he says after the wall had been rebuilt and had set the doors in place and the gatekeepers and singers and the levites were appointed and i put in charge of jerusalem my brother hanani along with hananiah or it could read uh, who is called hananiah the commander of the citadel because he was a man of integrity and feared god more than most men do that's his qualifications we don't know about his skills abilities talents or whatever he was a person of integrity and he feared god most than more than most others do he looked to god nehemiah looked to god the people all looked to god all of them whether they were uh, the clansmen of tekoa or the daughters of shalom or the uh, goldsmiths or the perfume makers they were all involved all working together they had each other and they were all looking to god uh, as well and that was so important even when nehemiah heard about the situation of jerusalem at first when he was far off in persia he prayed to god when he had to speak to the king he prayed to god when he was surveying the walls he talked about what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. When he spoke to the people about the work, he talked about the gracious hand of my God upon me. And then he said, the God of heaven will give us success. When our strength was faltering, he said, remember the Lord. He was always uh, looking to God. Uh, I remember once uh, I had some flying lessons. I've always dreamed of being a pilot, actually. <laughs> I think that dream's gone now but actually my family very kindly as I was growing up got me some flying lessons which I loved and then a while back is a while back now from my 40th birthday my wife also got me uh, a flying lesson for fun and it was great and I remember the instructor saying don't look down at the instruments which is important to do apparently from time to time but if you try and look up keep your eyes lifted and look at a point in the horizon uh, then the plane will stop uh, wobbling about like that which is how i was kind of flying it at the time keep your eyes fixed on a certain point keep them lifted up it reminds me of peter when he was walking in the water as soon as he started looking at the wind and the waves he began to sink but when he looked up to jesus and called upon him he was he was pulled back up again and he was saved from his situation we need to be looking to god so much and that's important for all of us for this next season for this next stage may we look to god may we rely upon god may we know his strength and his hope within our heart for his blessings are so great so the wall had been completed and what nehemiah does next uh, after that is really important because it's instructive to us it tells us a lot about how we can build up our life uh, in the lord and how we can know true peace and security within because one of the things that nehemiah does is he makes sure that all the the gates and the doors are in place there was no point building a wall and repairing it all if there was just gaps every, every so often after the wall had been rebuilt he says in chapter 7 and i'd set the doors in place the gatekeepers and the singers and the levites uh, were appointed so the doors and the gates are all set in place to give the city peace and security and stability as well and that's so important when we're built up in Jesus when we know the wholeness that comes from the Lord we need to know peace within in fact I'm told by clever Hebrew scholars that when it says in chapter 6 15 so the wall was completed that word for completed has the same Hebrew consonants in it as the same word for shalom 
which isn't just an absence of conflict, it is a wholeness, a restoration of our soul deep within. It comes from the Prince of Peace, who is, of course, Jesus. And Jesus talked about gates at one point. He talks about being the good shepherd. He says he is the good shepherd. Of course he is. But he also says, I'm the gate for the sheep. He said this in John chapter 10. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Apparently the shepherd used to lie down where the gap in the sheep pen was and effectively be the gate to keep the sheep secure, to keep them in when they needed to be safe and to let them go out to find pasture, but also to, to keep them safe from things that might come against them. It says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. It's not just what we're saved from, it's what we're saved for, to know this peace in the Lord. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's through Jesus that we know this wholeness, this healing, this restoration within us, this completeness within us. Isaiah talked about that. He says, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it's through Jesus that we have this amazing life in God and peace with God and a peace of God within. Paul in Philippians talked uh, about a guard of our heart and our mind. He, he, he says this in Philippians 4, verse uh, 5 onwards. He said, uh, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And the word he's using there for guard is a slightly different term. We're now talking about a, a soldier guarding things. Paul was... <laughs> Uh, in a prison at this point, uh, and near Roman guards. And he was talking about the peace of God that actually guards our heart and our mind. It guards our feelings, our emotions. It gives us peace and stability within when we look to God and when we know his peace within. Paul knew that, and really we all need to know this peace at the moment, especially now. And we can really know that peace when we go deep into the Lord and rely on him, his strength, his hope, and his peace as well. So Nehemiah and the people, they've completed the wall, which is brilliant. Well done to them. They've put the, the doors and the gates in place and gatekeepers as well to keep them all safe and secure so they know peace within as well. Well, what now? What next? Well, the people, of course, that needs to populate the city. There's to be a life within it. And this was all about the people. It wasn't really about the wall, of course. The, the wall was a means to an end. It's so that the city could have life within, uh, or as a church is described, as a city on a hill displaying its light to those around. There was to be a life within this place. People, uh, families, commerce, trade, all of that going on, the social life of everybody as well. It's to be filled with joy and with, with hope. And so we're told in chapter 7, verse 4, now the city was large and spacious. There was plenty of room. But there were few people in it and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. And so he finds out who'd been in the advance party and there's various folks listed there and there's all kinds of folks involved. There's priests and gatekeepers and singers and descendants of various folks and then in verses 66 to 67 uh, and on we can read about uh, the number of people and even the number of horses and mules and camels and donkeys everybody is welcome uh, in this place and so 
Uh, there's life in there as well. You know, it reminds me a little bit about the reverse that had happened when the people were originally taken off from Jerusalem to what was Babylon and uh, carried away into exile. And it was a difficult situation for them, an unfamiliar territory. But uh, through Jeremiah, God sent them a letter. And uh, this is what God said to them. He said, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Uh, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then he said to them in that letter, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I've carried you into exile. And of course, the Lord is always true to his promises, even in a difficult situation. And we have been in a difficult situation recently, but the Lord is still true to his promises and he is still with us. And if the Lord said that to the folks there about, settle down, and pray for those around you. He, he certainly would have been saying that to the folks now when they're back in uh, Jerusalem to, to settle down and to, to prosper there. And so the people return and the people are, are to settle there and to bring uh, life uh, to the city as well. Although it must have been difficult for many of them because those who came from the outlying areas to repopulate Jerusalem, they would have been leaving behind villages, a familiar setting, uh, fields, uh, farms, businesses, wi wider family. So it was an unfamiliar situation for many of them, a new situation that they had to get used to, just like we are in an unfamiliar situation at the moment and are getting uh, used to it, of course, in a very different way, but there's still a transition for us as well. And in fact, later on in chapter 11, and we're told a little bit more about the residents of Jerusalem, we're also told in chapter 11, verse two, the people commended, also commended all those who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. So there were some who actually volunteered to come and to build the place up again and to bring life and hope and to be a blessing to those uh, round about us. You know, we, we are to be a blessing to, to people we find round about us as well. Uh, our, our work colleagues, uh, our, our family members, our friends, we can, we can bless them and bring hope even in a difficult and unfamiliar and dark situation. Some find it hopeless, but we can be a people who encourage and bless. I wonder who you could, who you could encourage or bless today by sending a note or a message or a telephone call or a card, something just to get in touch, even just a smile to a neighbor, something like that. And in fact, in the community round about us, in our street, uh, we can uh, bring hope to folks round about us through kindness and our humanity and, and our help. Now, Isaiah said we're to be a restorer of streets with dwellings as if there's to be a life about the place. Well, when God was writing to the people, yeah, even in exile in Babylon, he was, he was asking them to settle down and pray to the Lord for the city they found themselves in, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I'll bring you back to the place uh, that you're intended to be. We're going to come through the other side of all of this one day and we do need to keep hope alive. May we be a people of hope and strength and joy and may we bring that hope and strength and joy to those around us as often as we can to the glory of God. Okay, folks, that's me away for another week. 
uh, may you know great joy this week. May the joy of the Lord be your strength and remember that with God there is always, always hope. God bless you. See you next week.